Our subject here on Wednesday night is atonement. Atonement. And when you teach atonement, you're having to teach the day of atonement, the day, day of, day of. And you have to teach about the temple or the tabernacle. And you have to teach about the ark of the covenant because that was the only time that the high priest which had to be a son of Aaron, so you have to teach about Aaron. You, these are subjects you have to teach. When you're teaching on atonement, you have to teach on, on the temple, temple or tabernacle. It was called the tabernacle. It was a mobile temple. When they were in the, when they were in the wilderness, God gave the instruction to build the tabernacle. Then when they came to the promised land, to Canaan, they had to, re they had to construct it there in the form of the temple in 1 Kings, and Solomon built the temple. And you have to teach the temple. You have to teach the ark, ark of covenant. And you have to teach blood covering. And you have to teach blood blood of Christ, because and you have to teach about the Lamb, the Lamb of God, Lamb. And, excuse me. You have to teach the Lamb, but you have to teach goat, the atonement goat. On the Day of Atonement, a goat was offered, but also that was in the tenth day of the seventh month, tenth day of seventh month, month and are the month Tishri, our month, September, October, Tishri, Tishri, September, October. And you also have to teach an atonement was made for the people by a lamb. You have to teach a lamb. These were both sin offerings. You have to teach sin offering. These were both sin offerings, and the lamb was a substitute, so you have to teach substitution. And the goat was a substitute for the sins of the people. So if you're going to teach the Day of Atonement, you have to teach the altar. The altar. And the altar was, this was a brazen altar. And we find that this is a type of the cross, Jesus' cross, or our, our daily cross, a daily cross, and you have to teach the shadows, which are the Old Testament, and the New Testament, very image, the very image is going to be the same thing as the old, except this will all be spiritual, spiritual there in Hebrews uh, 10 and 1, the law having a shadow of good things to come, and you have to teach the shadows, skia, Skia means a shade, and everything in the Old Testament was a shade, and now the law is written, the law was written on tables of stone, so you have to teach the law written on tables of stone, and now the law is written on fleshy tables by hearts. If that's true, hearts, then our hearts are the Ark of the Covenant. The law is in here. And you have to teach uh, the brazen sea over here. This is where the priest washed, and we're priests and kings, and we're washed in the blood of Christ. And the altar is the cross. And then you've got the seven candlesticks. Revelation 1 says that is the church or the refined church. And the table of showbread, we being many are one bread and one body, the bread is the church, and it's only the church because Christ is in us. That's the church. So you're going to be teaching all these things. You've got to teach on the church, and you got to, which is the wife. You have to teach on the wife. This is the most phenomenal study that you can get into, and you have to teach that Jesus died for his elect wife, elect wife 
or bride, husbands love your wives, as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. New Testament King James Bible says it, but it's the word A-U-T, Ada, and Ada is feminine gender. It's actually the word her. So if you're teaching this, uh, you're teaching something, you're teaching that Jesus only died for Israel just as the, as the goat on the Day of Atonement only was put to death for the sins of the people of Israel. And we are spiritual Israel, so you've got to preach on spiritual Israel. You have to preach on spiritual Israel, which is the church. And the church is the wife or the bride. I want you to notice everything that you have to teach on. And you have to teach on spiritual Israel. And you're only in Israel if you're circumcised, so you've got to teach on circum. I told you that when I started this, if I actually go through everything that has to do with atonement, it's going to be all of this and a whole lot more. So you have to teach on circumcision. Uh, circumcision. C-I-S, I win. C-I-S, I win. Circumcision. So you have to preach on spiritual circumcision. You have to be circumcised to be in literal Israel because the promise made to Abraham in Genesis 17 and, if, and when God made the promise to Abraham to be, I'll be, your, I'll be your God, you'll be my people. And Abraham had a son, Isaac. Isaac had a son, Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And Israel, according to the 54th chapter of Isaiah, is the wife of the bride of the Holy One, and that's Jesus. And he's the God of the whole earth and the Redeemer, according to Isaiah 54, so you have to teach on the Holy One and you have to teach on Israel. If you're teaching on atonement because husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Now, he didn't die for anybody except his wife, the church. Well, if he died for his wife, the church, and nobody else, you have to believe in what's called limited atonement. Was Christ's blood sufficient for the whole world well yes it was sufficient but did he die for the whole world no if he wanted to apply it to the whole world would it have been sufficient yes but he did not want to die for everybody because he didn't love everybody he loved jacob and hated esau before they were born if he loved jacob jacob's name was changed to israel so he loved israel and you have to teach your love and that's walking in the commandments of God, walking in the commandments. And so God's, God limited his atonement to his wife. He didn't die for everybody. The man in hell is dying for his own sin. So you, so you have to believe in limited atonement. When I say limited atonement, people think of limited atonement as a part of the word tulip. A total depravity of man. Well, man is totally depraved. The Bible says that there's none good, not one. There's none that understands and none seeks after God. And that all men drink iniquity like water. And that there's none righteous. Nobody seeks God. And there's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. So you have to believe that man is totally depraved. And unconditional... Unconditional election. Man is elected and favored by God simply by God's arbitrary choice. Man does nothing to be elected by God. Elect means to favor. God simply, by his arbitrary choice, favored certain men and disfavored the other. He hath not the pot or power of the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. And limited atonement, that means that God limited his atonement to his wife, his bride, Israel, the church, the body. And from body, we get the word saved and salvation. So you have to be teaching about salvation. You have to be teaching salvation. And when the Ark of the Covenant was sprinkled, 
you have to be teaching baptism. You cannot just simply take the word atonement alone without all these things associated with it. When you're actually going to teach on atonement, it has to encompass everything that's associated with it. In fact, everything has to... If you're going to teach on predestinate, prohorizo, to be for horizo, O-R-I-Z-O, and there's an H sound there, the critical mark, and it's our word horizon. Well, when you teach on horizo, horizon, to predetermine for the horizon everything that has to do with light, which would be Jesus, truth, and the list will go on and on, confessing truth, uh, and confessing what Jesus said, and righteousness, and godliness, and holiness, and everything that has to do with truth, you have to teach everything that's righteous and godly throughout the Scripture if you're going to teach on predestinate. When you're teaching on atonement, you have to teach on all these things. You can't teach on atonement without teaching on the Ark of the Covenant, on the Day of Atonement, inside the Holy of Holies, and you have to teach about a high priest sprinkling upon that Ark of the Covenant. Well, you also have to teach about Colossians 2.14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances or rituals. All of this was blotted out, but the law was not blotted out. The law is still here. Do we have to obey the law? Yes. Do we have to obey the law to have eternal life? No. But do we have to obey the law? Why? Because we belong to him and you're not your own. You're bought with a price. You're bought with the blood of Christ, so therefore, you have to do what he says. Now, you're also going to have to preach about, when you're talking about atonement, let me erase this over here. I, you know all this stuff is going through my head when I'm starting to preach. You're going to have to preach about atonement. You've got to teach about every word in the Old Testament for atonement. You got three major words for atonement. Pada, I believe it is. P A P O D A H. Pada, Gaal, and Kafar. And Kafar is the verb. And Kofar is the noun. And this actually takes you, this word kafar is the word pitch. It's also the word atonement. It's the word pitch, the ark within and without with pitch, Genesis 6, 14. Pitch, cover, and kofar means to stain and or to die. And what they did, they pitched the boats with a with a substance called bitumen, and it was asphalt in its natural state. Some said it came out of a tree. Some said it came out of the ground, like one of these geysers in the ground that was bubbling up. Well, that's not even the important part. It was a red stained color, and it would caulk the boat and keep the boat from sinking, and and it means to pitch with pitch, to cover with a stain or dye, and that has the same meaning. Kafar remembers the word atone, and when the Ark of the Covenant was sprinkled, it was pitched with a stain or a dye. And, you know, this actually takes us to what baptism actually meant. Baptized does not mean to dip into water. It absolutely does not mean to immerse in water or sprinkle with water. It's impossible for it to mean that because originally baptized, you have to tell people what baptized meant. And originally baptized was a, an infinitive. And if, you, if you're going to teach cover with a, uh, with, a, with a stain or dye, the Ark of the Covenant was sprinkled seven times and John says, we, uh, Peter says, we have to add to our faith seven things. And seven is the number of refinement. So the Ark of the Covenant is sprinkled. It is sprinkled 
with a, with a blood that comes from an altar over here with fluid from an outer source. The high priest would come in, go through that veil, and first of all, he would, he would, he would sanctify all the sections of the temple and, and sanctify himself and his, and his sons, Aaron and his sons, so they could work in the temple. They had to make an atonement for themselves. And then he'd come in and take this altar of incense and take a censer and take coals from the altar, bring it in here and inside the Holy of Holies or inside the house of God, and we are God's house now. The Bible says that Christ is the son over his own house, whose house are we, Hebrews 3 and 6. And then have to sprinkle the Ark of the Covenant, and our hearts are sprinkled. And I want you to notice the action. An infinitive is a verbal noun. And the word baptizo, the word baptize comes from B-A-P-T-I-Z-O and babto. Babto. Baptizo means to cover and babto means to stain or to dye. Baptize comes from these two words. It's a combination of two words. And it means to cover something, to stain it, to dye. It has the same meaning as pitch with pitch. And kafar means, is the word atonement. And if you'll notice, if you'll notice, on the day of atonement, the ark was covered all over with a stain or a dye. In, an infinitive is a verbal noun. It's a noun with verbal character. It's, a noun is a person, place, or thing. An infinitive is where that the fluid is moved from an outer source upon the subject. The fluid was moved from an outer source upon the Ark of the Covenant, and it was for the sins of the people. So atonement has the same meaning as baptize with babto. And of course, I've said this, they did not have a word in the English language. This is unlike most other Greek words. The word, they did not have a word in the English language to translate baptizo and babto because baptizo and babto, they incorporated the two to get the word baptize and they didn't have a word in our English language. So what they did, they changed the verb on the, excuse me, the vowel on the end of the word from an O to an E and anglicized the word baptize. Anglicized means to make an English word out of it. They simply took this Greek word with no word in the English language and moved it over into our language and made it into the word baptize. If it had have meant to immerse, they would have translated it immerse in one of the original translations a long time ago. It didn't mean to immerse. Even Mr. Girdlestone says it means, has a dual meaning. It meant to cover and it meant to stain and to die. And the movement was on the part of the fluid, not on the part of the person. So, dipping somebody down in water doesn't even imply a spiritual baptism. Uh, and besides that, the staining and dying is not there. He's washed us from our sins in his own blood, and there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So when he baptizes us with his blood, he's washed us from our sins in his own blood, that's the same thing he did to the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament. Now our hearts are washed with pure water in Hebrews 10, 22. And he shed abroad his word, his love, his agape in our hearts. And our hearts are the spiritual Ark of the Covenant. Like I've said before, uh, Indiana Jones can look, quit looking for that search. It's in the hearts of all the believers. Now, when you're teaching on all of this, you have to teach all of this has to blend together, every bit of it. And you have to teach, you have to teach on, I haven't even put these up here. And along the way, I'm going to go through all of this again. All of this connects to the same subject. You got to teach on reconciliation, And reconciliation has to do with this Ark of the Covenant. 
and that blood coming from the goat that's killed up on that altar. Christ became sin for us, or he became a goat in our place on the day of atonement, and that happened when he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then that blood was taken and sprinkled upon our hearts, and that's the blood baptism. But our blood baptism is not something we do, and we don't atone for sin. When he sprinkles us with his blood, our sin is atoned for. But we don't do the atoning. He atoned for the broken law. Look, look here. If you look at the Ark of the Covenant sideways, and the blood, the priest comes in, and he's sprinkling, the, he's sprinkling this blood upon this Ark of the Covenant, some kind of table there to stand in, it stands on, and he's sprinkling this blood. The law, the law is inside, and it's written on tables of fleshy tables of our heart. And all of us have broken that law in there. And the blood is going to have to cover that broken law so that we will be guiltless or without blame. Without blame. Now, we have been ostracized from the love of God when we sin. When all these people were gathering together around the around the around this temple and around the uh, Ark of the Covenant, their sin from the year before, their belief in this Lamb that was going to be sprinkled upon the Ark of the Covenant was going to atone for their sin. But the Bible says the blood of bulls and goats do not take away sin. It actually wasn't the blood of the goat that took away the sin. It was looking forward to Christ. And every one of these, every one of these sacrifices was looking forward to Jesus in the future who would come and die. And we're the very image and our hearts are the Ark of the Covenant. And the high priest is Jesus forever after the priest, after the order of Melchizedek. And he's that priest forever. And he comes and sprinkles our hearts. And the fact that he sprinkles our hearts, that is a blood baptism. Blood baptism. And that blood baptism by the blood of Christ shows that we are guiltless because that's a lamb without blemish or it's a goat in our place and it's sprinkled. And we are no longer guilty. We are, guilty. We are guiltless or we are without blame. Remember the word A-M-O-M-O-S. He hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame. But what part of us is without blame? The inner man. You got to keep remembering you have an inner man and an outer man. What Christ redeems and what he atones for is the inner man. The outer man doesn't do any atoning. He says, I have bought you, I have atoned for you, and bought has to do with ransom, so we've got to go through ransom thoroughly. Ransom and redemption. <coughs> and redeem. And we've got to go through forgiveness or forgive. You can't teach atonement without including all of this together. I've got dozens of books just on the word atonement, just on the teaching of atonement. Every one of these writers goes into great detail in this area of atonement. One will go, another will go into the detail over here. And you cannot actually have a full understanding of atonement until you understand that all these things go together. Ransom was the price paid. There was a price due. There was a debt. You have to teach debt. You have to go into the, I've got all these verses on debt, debtor. Uh, you're going to have to go into uh, blamed. You're going to have to go into guilty, guiltless. You're going to have to teach the word when the Bible says, we had the sentence of death in us. 
You're going to have to go into judicial, judge. All of this has to do with the tongue. You say, Jim, I can't ever learn that all. I can't either. <laughs> I'm just teaching it as we go, and I see a lot of these things, but you can't make atonement some simple little thing. Atonement is the very crux. It's the very foundation of Christianity. Christ was the substitute. You've got to teach substitute. Every time you found in the Old Testament, God said you've got to teach firstborns. We've been predestined to conform to the image of Christ that we be the firstborn. And the firstborns were, were given to God as a devoted sacrifice. And when you find this word devoted all through the Old Testament, it means something that has been committed to destruction. And every day they had a lamb they offered on this altar every morning at 6 o'clock. 6 is approximate time every evening at 6. Actually, it's sun up and sundown. They had a lamb, and it was a daily lamb up on a daily altar and the altar was a picture of the cross, and we have to take our cross and die daily, and we're a picture of these daily lambs. And we're lambs to the slaughter every day. So every, and where did they get these lambs? In Israel, every firstborn, God said, when you came out of Egypt, when you came out of Egypt, I, I had you place the blood upon the doorpost and when you're coming out of Egypt at the Passover, got to put that in here, I bought every firstborn in Egypt that came out of Egypt among men and all the animals. So all the animals, all the firstborn of animals were mine. What he means by that is I want all the firstborns to be offered in sacrifice unto me. Unless it's an unclean animal and you find the clean and the unclean, in Deuteronomy 14 and Leviticus 11. And a clean animal would part the hoof and chew the cud. Every one of those clean animals I want as a daily sacrifice offered to me here. And he said, I want daily sacrifices every day. But if you have an ass, and an ass is, and this ass has baby asses, and they're born. Every firstborn ass belonged to God, but an ass is an unclean animal. So God says, you have to substitute a clean animal, a lamb, for that ass, so I can offer the firstborn upon the altar. That's a picture of us. We're all as an unclean thing, and Christ is the substitute lamb, and that's the inner man, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So we have this inner man and this outer man, and we have to be redeemed, and that, all this has to do with forgiveness. The people were gathered around. They had to believe God. And we also have to teach on fasting, don't we? Because on the Day of Atonement, in this, in this tabernacle, when the people gathered around, one fast was, was uh, set down by God in Israel. One official fast was set down by God officially as a law of God that was on the Day of Atonement. What if I said on the Day of Baptism? What if I said on the Day of Blood Baptism? There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and a blood baptism was a martyrdom or death to self, wasn't it? Death to self. Well, on that Day of Atonement, they had to afflict the soul. You had people say, well, what does the... Sprink of the Lamb have to do with our righteousness, our living right. It has everything to do with it because you couldn't be partaking in the Lamb unless you were afflicting the soul. The word is A-N-I-Y. It means to humble self. Or it was a giving up of self, the true fast. They called it afflict the soul. And it is... The fast that God says, I have chosen in Isaiah, the 58th chapter. You say, Jim, that's just an awful lot of information. I know that. I don't expect you to get this quick. This is a long, long, long study. Jim, can you explain the Christ 
Christ atoning for the inner man and not the outer man, thinking that the outer man is the one that's sinning. And that would be well, let's go over here. Let me show you something. I was going to get to this later, but I'll do it right now. Look over here in Mark and Matthew 18. Matthew 18. <clears throat> He didn't die for the outer man. The outer man has no hope. We have to die. And when we die to self, that is for righteousness. That's for doing righteousness. We have to die. But look here at Matthew 18. Let me show you this. All right. Matthew 18. The inner man can't sin, can it? The inner man is completely innocent. 1 John 3 and 9. Whosoever is born of God. Those that are born again. Whosoever is born of God uh, doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, his sperma, the sperm of Christ, or the, uh, the sporos, the scattering of the seed, remains in him and he cannot sin because he's born of God. That's in 1 John 3 and 9. So the inner man can't sin. That's, that's Christ in you. And if we say we have no sin, 1 John 1 and 8, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Well, if he died for someone and declared them innocent, he died for the person that he has birthed on the inside. This outer man has to die and eventually it will die. It will die off to self. It's full of greed and covetousness and and all the rest of this. Let me show you this right here. Look here in Matthew. Matthew 18. All right. Matthew 18. And all through Matthew, Matthew will continually say, the kingdom of heaven is like unto... And everywhere you find kingdom of heaven, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, poor in spirit is definitely not the outer man, is it? It's not the outer man. The poor in spirit has to be the inner man. Poor is the word P-T-O-C-H-O-S. It means emptied out. The person that's emptied out is the inner man. The outer man is going to be empty and he's going to die. But let me show you what this says right here. Look at verse 23. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, one and the same. The reason Matthew was said to be written to a Jewish convert to Christianity is because Matthew continually uses the words, the phrase, kingdom of heaven. About 200 B.C., the rabbis said, we do not like the word kingdom of God kingdom of God of God they are always afraid that when they said God they were pronouncing the name of God in vain that's why in modern books you see G-D if it's a Jewish writer they're afraid of writing God somewhere down of course that's not his name his name is his authority and that's his word kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven were one and the same thing so the rabbis Drop the term God, inserted the word heaven. When you look in Luke, Mark, Luke, and John, they usually use the words kingdom of God. Kingdom of heaven. John, Matthew said, blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven, in Matthew the 5th chapter. Uh, Luke says in Matthew the 6th chapter, blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, one and the same thing. And of course, kingdom of God means God was their king, and over there in Hosea, the 13th chapter, the Bible says God was the king of Israel. And then over in 1 Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel 12, that God was your king. Well, if Jesus is the king of the Jews, he was the God of the Old Testament that was the king of the Jews. That's what it's talking about. So when it says kingdom of God, the Bible says the kingdom of God cometh not with observation in Luke 17, 20, and 21. It doesn't come with something you can see. It won't be one of David's descendants. The kingdom of God is in you, Jesus said. Well, kingdom of God was a term for Israel, and we are spiritual Israel. We're the church, we're the wife, we're the bride. 
So Jesus died. Wasn't Israel God's kingdom? It wasn't the headquarters, the, the, the Ark of the Covenant. That's where he sat. That's where he ruled Israel from. That The kingdom of God, the capital building, was the temple. That was the capital building. And what was the law of the kingdom of God? The word of God. That was their laws. That's what they lived by. Now, he says, Therefore is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, or the church, or spiritual Israel, likened to a certain man, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. Here is a debt that can't be paid. It's a picture of the debt of sin that we are over here being held in bondage or captive in sin, and we're in darkness, and there is the debt of sin upon us, and we cannot pay it. We're not able. First of all, we're not a lamb without blemish. And it's going to take a lamb without blemish. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Remission is the word forgiveness. Aphesis, it means no pardoning of sin. And the whole idea of the Ark of the Covenant being sprinkled, or our hearts sprinkled, is forgiveness. It's a covering of guilt. That's what it is. Then he says, And when he had begun to reckon... One was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents, a debt he couldn't pay. This is a picture. The kingdom of heaven or the church is like this. This is actually a reference to the Ark of the Covenant, a debt that can't be paid. It's a parable, a parabole. It means to cast down Ballow to throw down beside what's he throwing it down beside the kingdom of heaven Israel and where Israel was ruled was from this temple it's throwing down beside this there's a debt we couldn't pay and Jesus was the goat on the day of atonement and he covered and stained and died I like to put it like this I've done this before you can't live the way you want whenever he buys you. That outer man keeps trying to live the way he wants. And when, he, when you belong to him, he tells you in this 18th chapter what he's going to do when you try to live the way you want. This, this altar in front of this, in front of this, in front of this temple, it's a little big there, this altar, that's the same thing as the cross. And the, and the goat was killed on that. And the blood is sprinkled upon the Ark of the Covenant. From this cross of Christ, the blood is sprinkled on every one of the elect of all time. And that is a ransom that's being paid. And the ransom that buys us back. Ransom means to buy back. We have sinned and incurred a debt that we can't pay, and he spreads this blood from his cross. And this is our hearts. If you could incorporate all the elect of all time into this one area, and this would be the hearts of all the elect, this blood from the cross of Christ is sprinkled on us, and that causes us to be blood baptized and if you're blood baptized, you will die, won't you? He will see to it. You don't have any choice in it. You don't have any. This is not the choice of the people. It was God's choice to choose Israel. You didn't choose me. I chose you, he said. He said, I didn't choose you because he's the greatest of nations. I chose you. You're the smallest. Now, let's go back over here. So this is a parable. Yeah. No, the goat. The lamb was the lamb. I brought this out in several of the messages. I said it accidentally while I didn't mean to. That was the, remember, there were two goats. 
two goats on the day of atonement in the 16th chapter. One, one was the Azazel, the scapegoat, and he was driven into the wilderness. The other was the goat. <coughs> and that, the goat that they placed the sins uh, on the, the high priest would place the sins in was figurative placing. That goat didn't take away sins. The Bible says the blood of bulls and goats in Hebrews 10 and 4 doesn't take away sins. That was a picture of Christ to come. That's what's really, truly amazing when he says, hold your place here and look here in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 5. Second Corinthians 5, verse 21, For he hath made him to be sin for us. For is the word hooper. It has many applications, but concerning a sacrifice, it means instead of or in our place or as a substitute for us. God hath made him to be, I like to put it this way, God hath made him to be a goat in our place. Instead of us, who knew no sin, he didn't know any sin, he was without blemish. That's what God requires as an atonement for sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's the inner man, isn't it? The inner man, it has to be the inner man, it's not the outer man. The outer man has not made the righteousness of God. And you go back over here to Leviticus, the 16th chapter, Leviticus 16. <clears throat> I went through part of this the other night. You know why I believe that people don't teach this? It's very, very intricately detailed. But if you'll notice, it's all tied together, isn't it? It's all tied together. All right. He says, I will appear upon the mercy seat, uh, upon the cloud, upon the mercy seat. So he's going to come down in the cloud upon the mercy seat. In verse 5, he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two goats, two kids of the goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer his bullock of sin offering, which is for himself and make an atonement for himself and for his house. And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord, and the other lot for a scapegoat, or Azazel. A-Z-A-Z-E-L. That's an old ancient term for Satan. Now that has to do with casting out demons, doesn't it? That word goat there is S-I-Y-R means demon. Not a demon in the sense that, that they believed in the first century that Hercules was a demon and the demons came down and lived inside of you. They classified goats as demons or demon. That was a word they used. And any time, even in Satanism today, people depict the goat And this is supposed to be the horns and the, and the beard of the goat and the eyes here and the beard on the side. The goat, that's a picture. That's the uh, upside down pentagram. That's supposed to be a picture of the goat. And they, in paganism, they always depicted a goat as a demon or Satan in that sense. Not that Satan looks like a goat. Satan comes looking like a Baptist preacher is what he comes looking at. He's Satan trans. It's Satan transforming himself into an angel of light. Then he says in verse 8, Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat, and Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering, but the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat. And verse 9, the goat is going to be made for a sin offering and for an atonement for the people. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. 
And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering which is for himself and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house and shall kill the bullock. He's got to cover his sin before he's able to go and cover the sins of the people as the high priest. And shall kill the bullock of the sin offering which is for himself and he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord and his hands full of sweet incense beaten small and bring it inside the veil. Inside, inside here. He's going to come in here and bring it inside here. Incense. Some say he laid this censer between the cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant and then brought incense from off this altar of incense and put it on there so it would cover this inside of here so that uh, whenever God would come down and sit up on the Ark of the Covenant, he wouldn't die. He wouldn't take a peep up there and look at him. And if he saw God, saw him sitting on the Ark of the Covenant, he would be struck dead. Now, let's continue to read here. And then I'll come back to Matthew 18. Because these two chapters, believe it or not, Matthew 18, what we're reading, corresponds to this. Because Matthew 18, the man has a debt he cannot pay, doesn't he? Right here we have a debt. We can't, Israel has a debt they can't pay. <laughs> All right. Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering. Oh, you know, verse 12. He shall take a censer full of burning coals. It is a golden censer. Remember Nadab and Abihu, there in Luke, uh, Leviticus, the 10th chapter, offered strange fire to God. That's the two sons of Aaron that God struck dead because they offered strange fire. In all probability, they took fire from the wrong place for this censer. Nobody, we don't really know exactly what it was, but it wasn't. It was strange fire because the fire had to come from the altar, the brazen altar. It had to come from that altar. They may have gotten it from the candlesticks on the southern side of the outer sanctuary here. They might have said, well, this is closer. Let's just get fire from here. God won't mind. God would kill them if they did one thing wrong against his instruction. He shall put incense upon the fire before the Lord that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat so that when God comes down in the cloud to sit upon the mercy seat, mercy seat in the Hebrew is the word kaparoth, K-A-P-P-O-R-E-T-H, kaparoth. Kaparoth comes from the word kafar. Kafar means to cover. And that's the mercy seat is going to be covered. Now, why was it called the mercy seat? Because God's going to show mercy to Israel to cover their guilt. He's going to use a goat instead of them. God makes Jesus to be a goat in our place. That is upon the testimony that he die not. The, the mercy seat in all the inner sanctuary has to be filled with the cloud. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring his blood inside the veil and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat before the mercy seat, the blood of a goat. That goes with, hold your place there. I'm going to come back to Matthew 18. But over to Hebrews, Hebrews 10. You know, this is a lot of stuff, but it, it doesn't seem to be that complex. Now here in, in verse 19, 10, 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the Holy of Holies by the blood of Jesus. If the Holy of Holies, which is the house of God, which is us, in whose house are we? And the Holy of Holies was called the house of God because he lived there. The word dwell between the cherubim. Dwell means to marry. He married Israel, didn't he? We enter in by the blood of Christ. If we enter in by the blood of Christ, the only time anyone entered into the holiest was once a year 
tenth day of the seventh month with the blood of a goat. Isn't that right? Then if we enter in by the blood of Jesus, Jesus has to be a picture of that goat, doesn't he? Right? He's not a picture of the lamb. The lamb, when the blood was sprinkled upon the doors of the houses in Exodus 12th chapter at the first Passover, that was a lamb. It could have also been a goat for the poor people. But he's saying here that the blood of Jesus, the type of the goat, or the goat was a type of Christ when he died for us. I don't know how people have missed this. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you study the two goats of Le Leviticus 16, I don't know how preachers have missed it. I understand how you could miss it, but I don't understand how preachers could miss this preaching for 25 or 30 years. If you enter in by the blood of Jesus, then Jesus has to be the picture of that goat, doesn't he? And the goat has to be the picture of Christ. By a new and living way, the way we're going to enter in is by a new and living hodos. It's the narrow way, isn't it? Now is the word thalibo, it's tribulation. So the way Christ enters in is through tribulation in our life when our hearts are sprinkled, and that's a blood baptism, and that comes about by tribulation for telling truth, doesn't it? That's how it comes about. By a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us, through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And his flesh is the bread in the 6th chapter of John. And the bread is the body in the 10th chapter of 1 Corinthians. And the body is the church in the 1st chapter of Colossians. The veil is the flesh. The flesh is the bread. The bread's the body. The body's the church. The church is the wife. And that's who Jesus died for on the atonement. He was the Passover. He was the atonement goat. He was the Passover lamb. And having a high priest over the house of God, which is the inner sanctuary, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled. That's an infinitive. Sprinkling, the fluid comes from an outer source. And it's a staining and dying. Was the Ark of the Covenant covered with the stain or dye? Well, yes, that's baptism, isn't it? That's a blood baptism. That blood reaches out and covers all the elect and hits all the hearts of all those of all time, doesn't it? And it only, it's kind of like the old Polaroid cam cameras. It only takes on the elect. The blood flows right by all the non-elect, and it takes on us. It's kind of like a fluid flowing, and it sticks to us. And it, the other people don't have anything for it to stick to. And that's the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction having our hearts sprinkled, and the law is written on fleshy tables of the heart, isn't it? And it was written on tables of stone over here. So having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Conscience, sunitesis, means the way our hearts are sprinkled. This goes back to the inner and the outer man. Remember, conscience is the word sun, E-I-D-E-S-I-S. It means to soon with, fellowship with, E-I-D-O, to see with. Well, we see with the inner man. What gives us conscience, the outer man tells us, and see, we worship what we see. Idolatry is idololatria, E-I-D-O-L-O-L-A-T-R-E-I-A. It comes from ido, meaning to see, and latria, meaning to serve. We serve Christ, the inner man, and over the years he causes the outer man to vote with him, and we see with him. And how many witnesses does it take to put a man to death? It takes two, doesn't it, among Jewish law. So the inner man makes the outer man vote with him that the outer man has to die. But what brings us to this point of the outer man dying? Years, years of trial. I'm going to put up here years of the tormentors, and you're going to see that in Matthew 18. 
years of the tormentors that they, that God turns us over to evil man, says, this man is not going to live with me. I will not live with a harlot a Babylon with self. Let us make us a name. You have to die. I bought you. I own you. You're mine. I was your substitute. You're mine. I, you're not your own. You bought with a price. You can't live the way you want. Now, where was I? And he goes on to say, and our bodies washed with pure water. Pure. What was pure water? Living water. The Jews said living water was in those underground streams that was rushing. Anything that was moving water, they knew it was clean and pure. They may have not known the chemical factors involved, but they knew if it was running, it would get rid of the impurities. Well, living water is equated with the Holy Spirit. So our bodies are washed. Our bodies are washed with the Holy Spirit so that we will live right and live righteously and we could commit the members of this body to Christ. Now let's go back over here, over here to Luke 16, Leviticus 16, then I go back to Matthew 18. How much time do I have? Whew, man, I, I've got so much to go on this. Hope you all see it's going, it takes a long time to get through this atonement. The atonement, the reason Jesus died for us on the cross was to cover sin that we were responsible and accountable for, and it was a debt that we couldn't pay, so he took our place. He died in our stead. Yeah. Well, but look, look. Not the, well, he wasn't the picture of the scapegoat. He's the picture of the, the goat that was offered. The scapegoat, I want to get into the scapegoat. The scapegoat is a picture of the demon's of Matthew the 17th chapter this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting the scape was a picture of of sin in the life of the believer being driven out being casting out demons this kind genos kinfolk goeth not out but by prayer and fasting only one fast was in Israel the young man that was a lunatic moonstruck he wasn't moonstruck he had, he probably had epilepsy. If you had something, they said, oh, you got the de demon in you. Jesus said, demons are self. He said, that's all they are. Well, this kind, kinfolk go up and out by, by prayer, buying to the will of God, and fasting. The only fast in Israel, the only official legal fast was on the day of atonement, what is called afflicting the soul. And if you go to Isaiah 58, God says, is not this the fast that I have chosen to loose the bonds of sin, to bow to God's will? He said, that's what the true fast is. It's not giving up food, it's giving up self. Now, look here in Leviticus 16. We're going to go into, the, I'm going to go through the scapegoat, but I'm going to kind of get on down here till we get to the scapegoat. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place, verse 16, for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel, because of their transgression in all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place until he come out Nobody is to go into the temple while the high priest is in there. They're all, who are they? They're outside waiting. Some say it was about a 30-minute wait for the priest to go in there and do all of his duty to make an atonement for himself with the blood of a bullock inside here and to bring in this and to bring the altar of incense in here and to bring also to bring in here to bring in the blood of the goat off the, off the altar. Took about 30 minutes. Let me remind you of wh where we, we saw the very image of that over here in Revelation. I'm still not through with Matthew 18. In Revelation, the seventh chapter, uh, 
no, the eighth chapter, excuse me, the eighth chapter, Revelation, the eighth chapter. They waited for the priest. In the 28th chapter of Exodus, he had these bells around his, the bottom of his, his garment. As long as those bells were ringing, everything was okay. The bell stopped ringing, and then God had killed him. He did one thing wrong, and God would strike the high priest dead and his sons who were doing the work. So long as it was ringing, and they came to a place that were waiting, and they waited approximately a half an hour, Mr. Edersheim says. And look here in verse eight, chapter 8, verse 1 of Revelation. When he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven, and heaven was a term for Israel about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels, or the seven messengers of the seven churches, which stood before God, and to them that were given seven trumpets, and another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer. He's talking about this temple here, the one we live in, a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. So he's talking about the same thing here. This is spiritual. In the Old Testament, it's literal. Let's go back over here to the, to the 16th chapter. So that's a spiritual table. Yes, definitely. Revelation 8. And then he says in verse 17, And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation while he's in there. When Christ is in this temple, he doesn't need our help, does he? And he shall go out into the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it and shall take of the blood of the bullock and the blood of the goat and put it upon the horns of the altar round about. They would take some of the blood of this goat and put it on the horns. Every one of these altars had horns. We're not talking about horns like on a bull. The best that most of the writers would, if that was the altar of incense right here, they had these little horns. And that's the way they always draw them, little short stubby things like that. If, if a man wasn't a murderer, and these had this, this altar, this altar where they killed all the sacrifices, if he wasn't a murderer, he could come and grab hold of the horns of the altar and be exempt from persecution until the judges came and took him before them. If, if you didn't get a hold of those horns, whoever was avenging some wrong against you would, would go ahead and take vengeance upon you. But if you could get a hold of those horns of the altar, you were home free. In fact, remember Joab and the Lord told Beniah, or Solomon there in First Kings, the first cha uh, First Kings, uh, the third chapter, he tells Benai, he says, "You go kill Joab." Well, Joab, David's commanding general, and of course David is dead, and and Joab had killed, had murdered Amasa, murdered Joab, murdered Absalom. He was a murderer. He went and grabbed hold of these horns when Benai, who was the captain of the host of Solomon, he had Joab's place. He took Joab's place. And Benai was a mighty man. Of course, so was Joab. But Joab's not going to fight all of Israel now that Solomon's king. And Joab had a hold of those horns. And Joab said, I'm not going to let go of the horns. You'll have to kill me here. Benai went back to Solomon and said, he's got a hold of the horns of the altar. Solomon said, you, you go kill him. And he went back to him. He said, he said, you'll have to kill me holding the horns. And Benai said, that's not going to be a problem at all. And he killed him right there on the spot. But if you were murder, this was no sanctuary. It wasn't a sanctuary for Joab. Joab knew something about the law of God, didn't he? But he didn't know enough. <laughs> he didn't know if he was a murderer, he couldn't be saved. Now, uh, where was I? 
Okay, we're going to come back. Uh, well, in night, verse 19 of Luke, not Luke, Leviticus, I'll get it right in a minute. 19, well, let me read 18 and 19. He shall go out into the altar of the Lord and make atonement for it and shall take the blood of the bullock and the blood of the goat and put it upon the horns of the altar round about and he shall sprinkle the blood upon it with his fingers seven times, cleanse it and hallow it from uncleanness of the children of Israel. Now we're going to come back to verse 20 later, but let's go back over here to Matthew, the 18th chapter. Remember I said over here, you're going to learn the truth and you're going to go through years of trials or you're going to be turned over to the tormentors, those that torment you. And they might be righteous men, they may be evil men until God teaches you that self can't have his way. That's what he's talking about here. Now the kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain man which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed 10,000 talents. A lot of money. But for as much as he had not to pay, he didn't have the money to pay the debt. It was a debt he couldn't pay. We have a debt we can't pay. His Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife. Bond slaves. When you study atonement, you have to study bond slavery. The word ransom means to buy back out of slavery. When you're ransomed, kofir is one of the words ransom. You've got several words for this word ransom. And it means to buy back ga'al or pada, G-A-A-L. Remember that word, P-A-D-A-H and G-A-A-L. These words have to do with the right of a kinsman. There in Ruth, book of Ruth, Boaz, after the nearest of kinsmen could not buy Ruth, he bought Ruth, a Gentile wife, a picture of Christ. And Boaz and Ruth are in the lineage of Christ in the first chapter of Matthew. And that is the right of a kinsman. So he sold and to ransom someone, you have to buy them out of the debt that they owe. And Jesus bought us with his blood. He bought us out of darkness. But he didn't buy everybody out of darkness because he didn't die for everybody. That day of atonement was only for Israel, wasn't it? The wife. And he, he, sold, he was sold his wife and his children and all that he had as payment to be made. Someone's going to have to pay a ransom for this man, aren't they? And this is what the Day of Atonement was about. It was about a ransom for us, a ransom in our place, a ransom as a substitute. It's a substitutionary payment. What it is. Somebody's going to have to pay the debt of sin. The wages of sin is death. And all men have to die for their sin. Unless you can get in the death for sin, it is an atonement for sin. When you come to sin, when you come to the first sin in your life, you're not making an atonement when you die spiritually. To be atoned for that death, let me put it, let me put it upon the board. Some have tried to say the wages of sin is death, so when you come to sin, that's the wages of sin. No. He's talking about the second death in hell. When you're born and you're innocent, innocent, and we've got to study the word innocent too. We have to study the word guilty. We have to study all of this to actually study atonement because atonement means to cover guilt of sin and pronounce innocent. And justified, dikayao, means to render innocent. And we're not saved by works, but we're justified by works. Justify means to render innocent. D-I-K-A-I-O. D-I-K-A-I. I know you may have to listen to this DVD a bunch of times. If you listen to all of them I've been doing, you'll start getting a picture of this. Now, you come to the knowledge of good and evil. Good and evil. 
and you're in darkness and you're in debt to God and you have sin that you can't pay for, can't pay. And if you're one of God's elect, he will buy you out of sin, but you'll still have that outer man. And he says, I'm going to get that outer man out of sin because I have bought this inner man. And this outer man is going to die so that he's not going to exist to any degree anymore if he lives long enough in this life. But salvation doesn't have anything to do with that outer man being saved. The outer man's not going to be saved. He's going to give us a new body in, second, in fifth chapter of Second Corinthians to take the place of this one. But he says, I will not live in this body with a harlot of Babylon. <clears throat> in the sixth chapter of 1 Corinthians. Now, where were we? So this man has a debt he can't pay. The servant, therefore, fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I'll pay thee all whenever I can. But we don't ever have the money to pay the ransom for all the debt we owe. We're in darkness. It takes a lamb without blemish to pay the debt. <clears throat> then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and Jesus only has compassion upon his wife, his elect, the church. And loosed him and forgave him the debt. God is going to forgive the debt through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's how he's going to forgive the debt. But the same servant went out. This is like us. We're born again and we got the inner man. And we got little faith. We got little faith. Oh, ye of little faith, only God's pistas. Puny faith. He says, now, I'm going to start working on this outer man, this man of covetousness and greed and arrogance and pride and, and uh, contention and strife. And uh, the list goes on and on. I'm going to work on this man. This man has to go. But watch what we do. We live a whole lot in ourselves, don't we? And how does he get rid of self? Well, he's going to tell you here in just a minute. And the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, that's me and you right after we are born again, which owed him an hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe me. Now, God has been merciful and gracious to us, and we're not gracious to one another. That's what he's saying. Didn't he start this off? The kingdom of God is likened to we're very unforgiving when we're living in the outer man, aren't we? Very unforgiving. I've had people here at Grace and Truth say, I'm not forgiving them. I don't care if they do apologize. Well, then God won't hear your prayers, and you're going to live in your sin, and God's got to turn you over to the tormentors. That's evil men. That's the sword of God. So God can kill that outer man. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I'll pay thee all. And he would not. I'm not forgiving you. God, you forgave me, but I'm not forgiving my. He owes me. But went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. Aha, put him in darkness, right? God brought us out of darkness. He ransomed us with the blood of Christ. The key, this is what the kingdom of God is like. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told it unto their Lord, the one who has redeemed this unrighteous man. He's not an unbeliever. He's a believer who's living in the outer man. And here's what God says I'm going to do to him. I bought him. I forgave him all the debt. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant. You are my servant, but you're wicked. He's not talking about vessels of wrath here. He said the kingdom of heaven is like unto, didn't he? Yeah. And this is a picture of atonement. This is a picture of ransom. I forgave thee all that debt because thou feardest me. Shouldest not thou also have 
had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors. Hmm. That's what God does with us when we're living in self and we're very unforgiving when we come to the knowledge of Christ. Oh, we've got that inner man that's perfect. But the outer man says, I'm not forgiving. I want my way. God says, I'm going to turn you over to evil men. That's the sword of the God. God. And when I get through with you, you will be forgiving. And that's the outer man. This is what, well, how did they do that? What did they do when they were very unforgiving around Israel? What did they do? They offered another atonement goat the next year on the 10th day of the seventh month. But the Bible says, once Christ offered himself once for all, there's no more new sacrifice for sin. But, well, let me read the rest of this and we'll look at that again. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also to you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Now, how does forgiveness come? To repentance. But this man fell down and said, Have patience with me and I'll pay you all. I'm not forgiving you. You owe it to me. Give it to me. And he says, I will turn you to the tormentors to years of fire and trial and tribulation until you learn to give up. Until you be learned to be very forgiving. I'm more forgiving in old age than I was at 35. I was very unforgiving at 30 and 35 years old. I had practically no forgiveness in my heart toward a fellow believer who had done me wrong. That's what he's going to do to us. Well, see, look over here. This is what he's talking about in Hebrews, the 10th chapter. I read this the other day, but sometimes reading it a couple of times, when we look at this in a different way, you can see it. How much time do I have? Y'all realize how long this can go if we get into kafar and kofar, and then we got to get into the New Testament word for Atonement, which is the word katalage, katalaso. And this thing goes on and on. Look here. He's talking to us. Look at verse 26. If we sin for willfully, if we believers sin willfully, how about presumptuous sin? Planned sin. Standing in the light, sinning against God. If we sin willfully after that, we, believers, have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fear for looking for of judgment and fire indignation from the tormentors, from evil men, which shall devour the adversary in our life. And that's the outer man, isn't it? The adversary to us, or the enemy, He's the outer man. God's not going to let us get by with anything. It shall devour the adversary. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. You can't, and does the outer man despise the law of God? Yes. But the outer man has to die. You say, what if I don't want to die? Well, you're going to. It ain't got nothing to do with whether you want to. If God turns you over to the tormentors, if he turns you over to the sword of the Lord, which is his hand, when he says, humble yourselves under the hand of God, and David said, the, the sword is, the sword of God is evil men in his hand to cut us down. God says, I'm going to turn you over to these evil men, these tormentors, and you will learn to forgive. But if you forgive, the tormentors can be believers and unbelievers. <laughs> It can be immature believers and it can be mean, ornery, low-down snakes of unbelievers. I know that's true because I was very unforgiving to all these gospel singers that I sang with, whoremongers and dirty jokes and drinking and cussing and smoking and taking women to their motel rooms or hotel rooms and sleeping with them on the bus and 
I mean, I'm sorry, you gospel singers, but I'm not sorry. You bunch of heathens. You don't have anything I want, and you can't keep me, keep me from telling off on you now. Anybody that asks you for forgiveness, you're supposed to forgive them. Well, if anybody asks me forgiveness, whether they're a believer or unbeliever, they ask me forgiveness, I'll forgive them. I don't know who the believers are and who the unbelievers are. If someone asks me for forgiveness for something they did to me, but usually an unbeliever is not going to do that. But when somebody asks you, and the only reason a person will ask for that is they have repented themselves. And they've repented because they've been rebuked by God. If it's true repentance, they, if it's true forgiveness, they won't. Re, let me tell you something about forgiveness. Aphemi, A-P-H-E-I-M-I. Aphemi means to set aside, push it away as though it had never happened and you can never bring it up again. You can't say, yeah, but you did this one. Will you stop that right now? You forgave him. If he does something else, you can rebuke him. How many times shall I rebuke my brother? Seven times? Seventy times seven. That's the number of divine repentance because that's the 70 weeks of Daniel, isn't it? After 70 times seven, there's complete restoration. That's what he's talking about. But when you forgive somebody, you have to set it aside as though it has never, ever happened. That's awful hard, isn't it? Because you want to hold on to it just in case you might need to call him down. Okay, he, for, he asked me forgiveness. I forgave him, but if he gets out of line, I'll remind him of what he did. You haven't forgiven anything. You can't, you can't resurrect an old dead horse that's been buried. It's done. Can you? Huh? No, sir, you can't. Gosh, I've got so many places on this to go to. You've got, when we're talking about atonement, we're talking about a debt. We're talking about innocent, guilty. We're talking about circumcision, the church, the wife. That's the temple. That's the house of God. We're talking about the prayers of the saints. We're talking about the refined church, the altar, which is the cross. We're talking about the brazen sea which is the a picture of the blood of Christ the washing of Christ's blood as well as the blood upon the altar you got several places you got the you'll have more than one place that you'll have a parable you've got bread inside you got the manna or the bread inside the ark of the covenant and you got the bread on the table of showbread and both of those are a picture of the church but they're a picture of the church because Christ is the bread in us isn't he Well, you go back and rebuke them again each time. You, you go back, when, it, when you forgive them 70 times 7, that means you rebuke them 70 times 7. You rebuke them each time and then you forgive them. You rebuke them each time and forgive them. If your brother trespass against thee, rebuke him and if he repent, forgive him. You don't go around passing out free forgiveness. You rebuke for each. If someone keeps trespassing against you and keeps beating you out of money, you keep rebuking him and you stop loaning him money for one thing. <laughs> after the second time, but after the second admonition, what does Titus 3.10 say? Remember that? Titus 3.10? Look at it. We might as well read it. Titus, Timothy Titus. Titus 3, verse 10. So when you're talking about we're not forgiven unless the blood of Christ is over our hearts, are we? That's a blood baptism. That's a death. When Christ shed his blood as an atonement for our sin, at the same time, he washes our hearts, doesn't he? And that's, a, that's death to self. You, can't have a, you cannot have your sins atoned for without you dying. But your dying is not atoning. 
You're dying is because His blood was shed as an atonement upon your heart or your understanding and you get a new understanding. So your understanding dies, doesn't it? The heart was the place of understanding according to the Greeks and the Jews. So if the blood is sprinkled upon our hearts, our understanding dies and we get a new understanding, a new. And how does the new understanding come about? By the cross. Let me, let me give you something that's like, it, it goes click. The cross gives an understanding, doesn't it? What is understanding? Upostasis. Faith is substance. Upostasis is the word substance. Faith is the substance. Understand. Faith gives a different understanding. So when the blood is sprinkled upon our hearts, like it was sprinkled upon the Ark of the Covenant, we have a new understanding when the blood is sprinkled because the blood covers the broken law and we're thinking differently. We're not thinking about breaking the law. We're thinking about living righteously according to this blood. And what is it you learn? You have, you, a learner is a disciple, isn't it? Disciple means a learner, mathetes. And if you bear your cross, if you do not bear your cross, you can't be a disciple so a cross is a learner. A learner is one who understands. That's faith. Understanding was what they called the heart. God's going to give us a new heart, a new understanding, because our understanding is sprinkled, and our understanding dies. What we have been, if you're sprinkled with the blood of Christ, you won't sit around and say, I can live the way I want to. That's not understanding spiritual things, is it? You're going to be, if your heart's sprinkled, your understanding dies and you have a new understanding and you start seeking the things of Christ. And everybody here comes to me all the time saying, how can I get rid of this sin, Jim? I can't get rid of that one and I'm having a problem with this one. Well, welcome to my world. <laughs> As Jim Reeves said. It, it's, it's difficult for all of us. But the key to it is that you have a desire to die. You have an understanding that you haven't had before and that understanding is the Ark of the Covenant because the heart, when you read in McClinic and Strong, you look up heart, they'll tell you that the heart was the understanding. Everywhere you can find understanding. Understanding is our mother. Our mother's Jerusalem, isn't it? When you get in the third chapter, length of days and long life, she will add to you. Wisdom and understanding is our mother. Wisdom and a daily cross. Wisdom in this, in this altar when our hearts are sprinkled. Do you all realize the amount of abstractness there is in all of this? Abstract means you, you're not zeroing in on something specific, a table. The Bible says the altar was the table of the Lord. Notice how many different things it meanings it has. Well, that's where they kill the offerings and sprinkle the Ark of the Covenant. That's where Jesus was killed and his blood of the goat was sprinkled upon our hearts. And this was called the table of the Lord because the priest that did all the work around here, they took a flesh hook, whatever they were offering that day, they dipped it down into the altar and what they brought up, what they brought up had to be, that's what they got to eat. Well, it must have tasted awful blah with no salt on it. No, no. Every sacrifice had to be offered with salt. So it tasted like roast beef. It tasted good. And that's where the priest ate from, and that was called the table of the Lord. And that's where, gosh, if I had time, I'd like to go into Azazel. How much time do I have? Six minutes. So let's go back over here. Well, I didn't finish reading this in Titus 3. 10. A man that is a heretic. H-A-I-R-T-I-K-O-S. Heretikos comes from harrow. Heretizo. H-A-I-R-T-I-Z-O. It means to choose for oneself. You know what it means? Self-will. 
A man who wants his own way after the second admonition, after the second time you rebuke him, a man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. Get away from him. Knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. He's not talking about vessels of wrath. He's talking about vessels of mercy. None of these books were written. What's really a shame, people think, oh, he's talking about people are going to hell here. No, he's not. This book is written to his wife, nobody else. So whenever you see him comparing this, he's telling you how it's possible for you to live and how, how we have all lived. Such were some of you. It says that in 6th chapter of 1 Corinthians. We were that way, weren't we? Let's go back over here and look at first at Leviticus 16. Let's look at 17 real quick. Without shedding of blood in that ninth chapter of Hebrews is no remission. The word remission is the word aphesis. It's the same exact word as forgiveness. Leviticus. 16 is about the Day of Atonement, sprinkling of the blood upon the Ark of the Covenant, isn't it? And driving the scapegoat or the Azazel out of Israel. Look here in chapter 17, right after 16, right after the Day of Atonement, look at 17 verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. I went through that one night. The life of the flesh is actually literally in the blood. The blood is made up of many things. You've got these little disc-like cells called hemoglobin. And they have oxygen in them. And these, this oxygen, when you breathe in, it's distributed throughout your, through your lungs into your blood. And your blood is carried, the oxygen is carried throughout your body upon these disc-like hemoglobin cells, and they are red. These, this oxygen, these red blood cells are called er erythrocytes, erythrocytes. And the white blood cells are called leukocytes. Well, all of your, the, the chemistry of your body goes throughout your body. This is oxygen, and it eliminates poisons. It eliminates uh, various... Uh, things that are alien to the body eliminates it also carries oxygen to your to your cells and your fingers and your arms all throughout your body and it causes a little explosion little fire in your body and it causes your your cells to die and it causes them to reproduce and the nurse would be able to explain this better than I'm explaining it but it actually the life of your flesh is in your blood. The reason there has to be death, blood has to be shed in order for death. The life of the flesh is not in a cup of blood. That means somebody's blood has been shed, and when you drink of a cup, you're drinking of somebody's death. Now, the pagans said you're drinking of their life. But that's not true. You're drinking of their death because only the life of the flesh is in the blood when the blood is in the body, not when it's in a cup. If it's in a cup, somebody's died, hadn't they? So when the pagans said the life of the flesh is in the blood, they said you drink of somebody's life. No. You drink of their death. Because it has to be inside their body, transporting oxygen throughout the body and doing all this elimination process and reproducing cells and so forth. It's actually in the blood. So when God says this here, in the 11th verse, Leviticus 17, 11, he is giving, giving you a biological chemical fact. And they don't know chemistry yet, and they don't know biology yet. But he's telling us that. But he knows biology, doesn't he? He knows about jet planes at this point, too. And rockets to the moon. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. Somebody's got to die, don't they? If it's not you, it has to be a substitute. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. 
Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, No soul of you shall eat any blood. That's why Israel is told not to eat anything strangled because the blood is still in the body. They had to drain the blood out of the body. If you don't drain the blood out of a deer when you kill it, it putrefies and it tastes awful. You got to drain a deer correctly when you kill it. Has anybody ever tasted that wild taste? It's cause the blood is still there. But deer is fantastic if it's bled right. A lot of people won't eat deer because I ate it one time and somebody, ah, that's why you didn't eat it by somebody who knew how to. If you did a cow the same way, you didn't bleed it, it'll taste bad too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Then he says, Neither shall any stranger that sojourneth among you eat blood, and whatsoever man there be of the children of Israel, of the strangers that sojourn among you, which hunteth and catcheth any beast or fowl that may be eaten, he shall even pour out the blood thereof and cover it with dust. Remember though in the 15th chapter of Acts, the Lord was telling Israel not to eat anything strangled. That's because the blood was still in it. For it is the life of all flesh, the blood of it is for the life thereof. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh, for the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Whosoever eateth it shall be cut off, and every soul that eateth that which died of itself, or that which is torn with beast, whether it be one of your own country or the stranger, he shall both wash his clothes and bathe and himself in water and be unclean until the evening, and then shall he be clean if he be washed if he wash them not, he bathe his flesh, then he shall bear his iniquity. And that's why don't anybody go around eating roadkill. Because <laughs> it's been laying there and putrefied. We're going to come back to this Sunday morning. I hope you're beginning to get a hold of some of this. It's, there's so much to it. All this goes with it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and for truth. Cause it to continue to work. Deal with our hearts, Lord. <clears throat> Strengthen the flock. Strength, give me strength, Lord. Sometimes I get weary and tired and I just want to sit down. But Lord, you know I'll get up and keep going. You've given me that perseverance. I pray you'll give us strength. Let me learn the word. Keep teaching it. God will give you praise for everything. In Christ's name we pray, man. Hey, Robert. Uh, that car, you know, that's not not fixable. He said it's not. Huh? It, it is. Huh? It, it's fixable.